come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Well, come all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there With open arms For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live Oh, the power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom. For oh, God so loved, God so loved the world. to 
Welcome to Terrace Lakes Wednesday night service. I'm Danny House, and I'm the senior pastor here at uh, the church, and we're glad that you've joined us uh, this evening. We have been going through a series on the Sermon on the Mount that I have entitled Life in the Kingdom of Heaven. And now we've arrived at chapter 7, the final chapter in the Sermon on the Mount, and I've entitled this uh, this chapter choices, because as we go through the chapter, we see that really there are so many choices that we have to make. And these choices are all have, have to do with relationships. For instance, last week, we talked about Jesus's admonition to uh, judge not let, lest you be judged. And we talked about what that meant. And the choice is, I'm either going to have a loving, uh, merciful uh, attitude or relationship with my fellow believers and or I'm going to carry a judgmental spirit toward them. The choice is mine. This evening we're going to talk about our choice to relate with God as our as a distant deity or a loving heavenly father. Which will it be? Now this evening, I also want to, because we're talking about in this relationship, we're also talking about the pr a prayer relationship uh, with our Heavenly Father. I want to address some, I guess, objectionable questions about prayer uh, or concerns about uh, concerns uh, about prayer that sometimes you may hear. The first question is, isn't it arrogant to tell God what I need when he already knows? The second one would be, why pray when people who don't believe and don't pray seem to do pretty well apart from it? And the final one is really more of a statement than a question. But the, the statement would be, not only does God give to people who don't ask, but many times he doesn't give to those people who do ask. So those are good questions that I want to address but first, before we consider those questions, let's look at Christ's teaching as it applies to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, if you'd like to follow along. along. Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, 
and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask of him? Now, these five verses teach us that Christ wants us to embrace our relationship with our Heavenly Father uh, with confidence and with boldness. Now, this is something, honestly, that the Jewish believers, the people that are listening to Jesus at this time, could have ever imagined. After all, we're talking about the God who brought Egypt to its knees, the God whose holiness would consume your life if you entered his presence flippantly. How could you even think about daring to approach such a God? But what we find is that through Christ and his teaching, we discover redeemed children can approach the throne of grace, and we can do that boldly. In fact, our God, our Heavenly Father, looks forward to us coming to him in that way. Now, when we look closely at verses 7 through 10, we see the only conditions that Christ gives is that we approach God the Father in a manner of a child who is secure in, his, in the love and the care of a parent. A parent of, uh, of young children, for instance, would absolutely understand the progressive pattern that Jesus lays out here. Ask, seek, and knock. As an example, the kids, uh, you know, little Joey's sitting on the couch and, uh, and he's watching Rugrats or whatever they watch today. And, uh, he's, he's out of milk. He's at a little zippy cup with, sippy cup with uh, milk in it. And he says, Hey, mom, can I have some more milk? He asks, but mom doesn't respond. Where's mom? So he gets up off the couch and he goes around looking for mom. And then, so he's seeking mom. And then finally he comes to the mom's bedroom door. And it's closed because mom's in there looking for three minutes of quiet uh, to herself. And then what does the little guy do? He, he knocks on the door. Hey, mom, can I have some milk? And how does mom respond? Well, she gets, goes and gets the little guy milk and he's back on the couch watching the, the Rugrat show. And so that is very practical. Any parent in any uh, generation would understand that. And so you can see just as the parent-child relationships are built on the confidence of mutual love, so is our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that's what Jesus, that's the picture that Jesus is giving us. In verses 9 through 10, Jesus is making the point that our Heavenly Father isn't setting us up to trick us. He gives our us our needs and doesn't withhold good things, as, for example, would a parent who is abusive. Would a truly loving father give his son a stone when he is in need of bread? Would a loving father put his child in danger by handing him a snake rather than giving the child what he needs? See, Jesus wants us to relate with our Heavenly Father and even address him as Abba. Abba Father is not, Abba is not a, a, a way that the Jewish people would address the Lord normally. But Jesus is in, introducing this title for God, this name for God, Abba, which is the most intimate name for God. It could be Dad or uh, 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 Daddy. So if your prayer life were a reflection of your relationship with your Heavenly Father, how would you describe that relationship? Is he a distant deity or is he your Abba Father? In verse 11, Jesus encourages his hearers to think deeply and comparatively and theologically about what he has just taught. Parents, he says, even though they are evil, 
or selfish by nature, still love their kids and give them good gifts. Now, I want you to notice here that Jesus is asserting an important doctrine, and that is the doctrine of inherent sinfulness in human nature. In fact, that doctrine is actually very critical to the point that Jesus is trying to make. The point being, even sinful people can do good things. Even the sinful or unbelieving parents uh, give good things to their kids. So Jesus is urging them forward in the thought process by having them compare the motivation of a sinful parent who still does good to the child to the motivation of an infinitely sinless and all-loving God. So Jesus is basically saying, isn't it reasonable to trust that our sinless and purely motivated Heavenly Father desires to give good things to those who are his children called by his name? Now, with that in mind, I want us to consider these questions or objections that people have about prayer. The first is this, isn't it arrogant to tell God what I need when he already knows? That's really a good question. Because in chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus has already said that our Heavenly Father knows what we need, so why do we feel like we should tell God what to do? It's not as if God is ignorant of our needs, after all, and so we have to tell him what those thing, those needs are. And is he so reluctant to give us what we need that, that we have to, you know, put prayer pressure on it? Well, the answer to that question, I believe, has less to do with God and more to do with us. In other words, I believe that the real issue is, are we humbly submitting to what God has to give? Are we humbly submitting to what God has to give? You know, a pivotal moment in my personal prayer life and relationship with the Lord came many years ago when I read the words by Pastor Eugene Peterson that that basically said, prayer for the child of God is an answering language. Now, in our culture, we've kind of been trained to go into prayer time and we're the first ones that speak. But Peterson makes the point, and uh, uh, rightly so, I believe, that, that really God is always the first one that speaks. And our prayer is really an answering language. In other words, uh, uh, I, uh, I want to relationally connect with the Heavenly Father. And so that requires me to be quiet and to listen to my Heavenly Father, listen to Him speak first, and then we're able to pray, pray an answering prayer as His Spirit guides us. Now, there's plenty of passages of Scripture that I think relate and speak to this issue. For instance, Paul tells us in Romans that we really don't know how to pray as we should. So what do we do? Well, the Holy Spirit guides us with groans that are too deep for words. In other words, the Holy Spirit guides, speaks to us, and guides our words in prayer. So doesn't it make sense that if the Holy Spirit guides you into how to pray, that you can expect that prayer to be answered? Well, we think so. The psalmist tells us to be still and know that I am God. Here again, be still and listen. Jesus said in John 15 that apart from him, we can do nothing. And I believe that includes prayer. Once C.S. Lewis was asked if he really believed he could change God through praying, and Lewis responded, prayer doesn't change God, it changes me. Now, I'm not saying there are times, for example, when you spontaneously praise God for his creation, or that you call out to him because of pain or grief. What I am saying is that if you are looking for an ongoing relationship with, our, with God and a better understanding of what to ask in accordance to his will for you, then you must learn to be still and know him. I will tell you that being still is a discipline that you have to practice and learn. 
I would recommend that you find a, a quiet place where you wouldn't be disturbed and you sit with your Bible open. Spend a few moments just taking some deep breaths and relaxing your body. Open the scripture and focus on a paragraph or a sentence or even a word. And then just ask the Lord to guide you in your prayer and wait for that. The more you mature in the discipline, in this discipline, the more you will pray in his will and also be ready to receive. Do you believe your relationship with the Lord is such that in prayer, your hands are always open and ready to receive from your heavenly father? The second question is, why pray when people who don't believe and don't pray seem to be pre doing pretty well? Uh, uh, apart from it. Now, observant Christians can look around and see that there are a lot of people who don't believe and who don't pray, and they are doing pretty well, thank you. So if people who don't even believe in prayer are having their needs met, then what's the point? Theologian John Stott said in thinking through this, it's really helpful to distinguish between God's creation gifts and God's redemptive gifts. For instance, with regard to his, uh, with regard to his creation gifts, Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, that God makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, theologically speaking, this is called the common grace of God. All people of the world, whether believers or unbelievers, can enjoy God's creation. Uh, they can have good jobs, enjoy good food, and good relationships. But God's redemptive gifts are very different. God does not bestow his salvation on everyone, but only on those who, according to Romans chapter 10, have called on the name of the Lord and have been saved. After salvation, uh, a believer begins to enjoy these redemptive gifts of daily forgiveness, of escape from temptation, of the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension. God's redemptive gifts, I think, in a lot of ways can be summed up in the fruit of the Spirit in chapter 5 of Galatians that reads, the fruit of the Spirit is love and it's joy and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, would you not agree that God's creation gifts mean so much more when you have experienced God's redemptive gifts? In other words, with the redemptive gifts, you enjoy both the common grace of God in his creation gifts and the lasting grace of God in his redemptive gifts. Creation gifts uh, alone last only for this life. Whereas, whereas redemptive gifts are eternal. Pray for those things that are eternal and trust the Lord in your life to add the rest. And finally, the statement, not only does God give to the people who don't, don't ask many times, he doesn't give to those that do. Now, an immature believer will take Jesus's words and it will be given as an absolute pledge from God to answer all our prayers, regardless with no strings attached. Then when their prayers are not answered, they may give up on it altogether, which impacts the relationship. Our Father in Heaven, we need to understand, is not a microwave God. He's not a God that we pop our prayers into and one minute, uh, they, and one minute later they come out all cooked up. It doesn't happen that way. Again, Stott makes a great point. He says, being good, our Heavenly Father gives only good gifts to his children. Being wise as well, he knows which gifts are good and which are not. You see, God gives us uh, answers our prayers according to his goodness and his wisdom of understanding what is best or not best for us. Think about it again to the to a child, an immature child, as he learns to talk and, and he's sitting at the table. And you know what's really good to eat from his perspective? Hershey bars. Hershey bars are wonderful. And so for supper, uh, he wants he wants Hershey bars to eat. 
In fact, he may be belligerently demanding, give me Hershey bars. But what does a wise mom or dad do? They give them they give him what he actually needs for nourishment, for the for the goodness uh, that that uh, will make give him a healthy body. Now, through time, this child grows in maturity and understands, while he still may love Hershey bars, that supper uh, that is provided by mom or dad is provided in a way, for, uh, in, in a way that is wise and best for him. And you learn that through times. So perhaps our prayer should go something like, Father, I'm asking for this thing, but more importantly, I'm trusting in your goodness and wisdom to give what is best for me. Well, even if you've read these words of Jesus on relating to the Father through prayer before here in chapter 7, I hope you have found even found this evening even more encouragement from from this chapter and from these verses. I have a closing question for you. How has being a redeemed child of God changed your daily relationship with Him? How has being a redeemed child of God changed your daily relationship with Him? How do you approach Him as a distant deity or a loving Heavenly Father? I'd encourage you to take some time this week to read back over these verses and ask the Lord to give you the good gifts He will wisely desires for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you uh, encourage us. You're waiting on us to draw boldly and confidently to your throne of grace. Father, give us wisdom uh, to know uh, your good gifts to us uh, come from the love that you have for us and from your wisdom. And Lord, I pray that our relationship uh, because of this would continue to grow and that we would hear your voice uh, more readily through your word and, and incorporated and, and empowered by your spirit. And so thank you for your goodness and your wisdom. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.